This is a training presentation of the American Public Safety Training Institute. I'm your host, Mike Pazesny, and thank you for being America's Peacekeepers. Hello, America. This is Mike Pazesny, and I'm here with Dr. Tamara Nasworthy, uh, who did her doctoral research on officer suicides. And we have completed one segment now where we talked about line hand suicide theory and the lower concept. And now we're going we're gonna to direct our attention a little bit toward interviews that she did with individuals who knew officers who had uh, committed suicide. And one of your questions was, tell me about the bonds you form with your fellow law enforcement officers. I'm assuming that that was so that you could better understand that person's interpretation of the police subculture. Would that be right? Right. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and it's a subculture, but also to understand, is there, are they antisocial? You know, was this person not going to really look at his coworkers as somebody that were his peers, but mainly to get at the subculture where they were? You know, some people you know, just kind of go to a job and they walk away, and I wanted to see how really – were they that were they in that subculture? Were they indwelled, or were they outside the subculture, just kind of working there? Now you quoted one of these people as saying, "I would say it's the closest bond you can get to anyone in some aspects, closer than my family, because they do things I would never ask my family to do." Exactly, and that was pretty much a transcending thought through all the ten that I actually spoke with, and I asked them to expound on that, you know, and give me some further feedback, you know, and basically, you know, what they said to me was. These people are going to defend my life. They're going to shoot somebody if I'm in danger. They're going to put themselves in that burning building that we've talked about where I would never ask my family to take another life for me. You know, if I'm standing in the way of a bullet and my family says, I'm going to take the bullet so my family doesn't. But if there's, if, you know, we're part, my partner would take that bullet on my behalf. You know, they know where I am. They understand that mental health side of me. And, you know, a couple of officers even said, you know, they're more like my wife than my wife because I see them more than I see my own wife sometimes. Mm. Now, you have one in here where you talked about some of the, the stronger responses to that same question. They and, and this person says they have to be important, and I'm not quite sure I understand what where this was going. They have to be important for you to function. You have to have that trust to accomplish your mission. You have to rely on each other to get things done. And then he continues, or another person continues, yeah, but I don't think it's something you go out and do. It's just the way it is in my generation of officers, 26 years. If you do something to him, you do something to me. But in the younger guys, it's different. Is, is, was that a 26-year veteran that was coming back and saying that in the younger generation of officers, it was different about yeah. how they considered each other? Right, it was. And that was, he was, I was really shocked to hear that. He was probably the only one that was a little bit of a dissenting voice, for lack of a better term. That actually said, you know, I don't understand that, that, you know, that they're not like we were. You know, when I came along and I was on the force as a rookie coming up through the ranks, we were tight. You know, we were in that subculture. But, you know, and I used to term with him, I said, what well, is it as close as, you know, you were way back when? And he said, well, you know, it's not like it was. They're not, we don't hang out like, they don't hang out like we used to. They don't have that brotherhood, you know. And he kind of indicated maybe in his opinion and what he was seeing with his respective department was that that subculture may be breaking up a little bit. You know, that maybe hopefully it's not the, the tightness, the cohesiveness that um, we've seen that you know, he saw 26 years ago. Um, is that good or bad? I don't know. Um, I think that's only something time will bear out and tell. Um, you know, is that officer willing to lay down his life for another officer? Is he willing to do the things that you would need to do and expect to be, you know, a true comrade in arms, so to speak, or is it just more that I and me and my generation coming through? Mm. Now it, it, you brought up, you know, you, you've been telling us now for for um, throughout this whole presentation how important it was to have a support system. And um, and again, you know, as I read through your research, there's there's more and more things that kind of pop out at me. Uh, but one of your one of your P six uh, interviewee said, um, quote unquote, uh, I learned quickly that my friends from before shunned me because I was a cop now. And and you know that that brings a whole new dimension into our discussion because we talked about how even the spouse may not be as close to that officer as the partner is. But then, too, that partner loses a lot of friends as a result of the fact that they're now on the police department, and, and some of their friends say, hey, he's just not too cool to hang around with anymore. Right. They can't go out and go drinking and get drunk and do the bad things that they used to do 
prior to him being an officer. Um, you know, and he that particular officer was actually a ranking officer in his department. You know, and he came up through the department. You know, he was a second generation law enforcement officer. You know, and so he kind of knew what he was getting into when he got into the force. But I think he really, in his mind, somewhat thought his friend would still be his friend. But then he pretty much showed in his question and in, in subsequent talking with him that you know his friends weren't his friends anymore because they weren't, you know, they weren't maybe comfortable doing what they would have done or wanted to do around him. I um, mean, you know, I'm sure it's got to be hard to totally, you know, hang out with. I don't have problems with hanging out with a cop, but I grew up with them, you know. But maybe people feel um, society feels a little uneasy because you're a cop now. So maybe if you have a bad, you know, parking ticket or whatever, you're afraid to be around your friends. But it shouldn't be that way, you know. Just because you put on a uniform and a badge every day, you're still my friend. You know, mm-hmm. you're still somebody that I should be able to hang out with. Now, you know, the flip side of that coin is that he set himself up to be different. You know, I think his answer said no. But maybe he was acting a little bit different in some ways, and he didn't see it. You know, mm-hmm. we'd have to go back and you know actually walk alongside him and look at his life patterns. Then, you know, maybe he set himself up to be disengaged from his friends. You know, he thinks no, but you know, you have to be there's somewhere in the middle. There's a reality there that we haven't, we're not going to be able to know because we weren't walking through his life with him. Mm-hmm. Well, now uh, you have a you have a later question here. I did not know the officer committed uh, who completed suicide. Why did you say who completed suicide rather than committed suicide? Was there was there some matter because of semantics the, in there that made that important? It's actually the and I learned this through the study through some of the people that I turned to for wisdom and guidance. Committed suicide is no longer the accepted term. It's completed. People if if I try to commit suicide, that's you know an attempted suicide is a commit. You know, I oh. the act of suicide you're committing. And, I, and that was my ignorance as a researcher going into it. You know, I just had always assumed committed suicide meant you, know, you, you, you actually succeeded. But they're like, no, Tamara, it's not, you know, to succeed, you complete. The act of doing suicide, you're committing a suicidal act. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense. But, again, I think that's, you know, something that we need to get out to society that, you know, it's you, whether you try and cut your wrist, you're still, that's a committing suicide act. Um, so, so committing suicide, commit so committing suicide is having a commitment that comes to fruition because you make the attempt. That, right. That's the way the mental health community is looking at it now. So, if right. I, if I, if I cut my wrist and, and the you know, 911 call goes through and they pick me up and I, you know, come home two days later and I'm perfectly fine, uh, physically. Um, that means I actually committed suicide, but I didn't complete suicide. Right, exactly. Okay. That, that's interesting. I, that, that's okay. I'm glad I'm reading this. That was really interesting much... for me. That was that was a really yeah. interesting part for me to realize, and that taught me something as a professional in medical and mental health that I, you know, I was ignorant to. E3 described the officer in the following manner. He was a great guy, do anything for you, one of the nicest officers I knew, would help you move or help you with things. He was a good mechanic. So here we have an officer who seemed to be very pro-social, uh, seemed to be happy, didn't seem to be uh, uh, separating himself from friends and family or any of this kind of thing. You say something about um, none of the officers who completed suicide, and you use that term completed again, were perceived as being unliked or problem officers. They clearly had formed bonds with their peers, therefore indicating they were accepted by their colleagues. And then you go into the wall of remembrance. Can you explain to everybody what the wall of remembrance is in in your area anyway, and what the significance was of the case that you found. Um, the wall of remembrance is if you die in the line of duty, and in some instances in some departments, if you have like you know you're you're killed in a car accident off duty, they actually in the departments have a wall where your picture's hung, you know your service time is put there, and you're remembered. You know they actually some um, in October I believe is the time they go back and they remember. You know, that, like a reflection of the officers that have died in the line of duty, a reflection of officers that have died that year. So, you know, you're put up, you're, you're memorialized for eternity. If you commit suicide or complete suicide, your picture's never put up there because it's shunned. In this particular department, it was a small rural department in the state that I went to. This officer in question was in a very small unit. Um, they were kind of, you know, off. They had a little department area. They all parked in the same place. They knew each other. Um, this guy was kind of a jack of all trades. He'd been in the department several years, very well respected, and they never, nobody ever saw it coming. It literally blindsided this unit, and um, it was it was traumatic to the point that they didn't park in the same place anymore because they, he actually completed his act on the law enforcement campus. You know, oh he actually goodness. apparently, and I'm not sure for for traumatic, you know, for for the for the total sake. But I mean, in essence, what I was given was, you know, he kind of, they found him like where he parked his car. 
you know, they found him where things were going on. So it was definitely, you know, a very traumatic act for this department to look at and do. And it definitely, you know, it, it had ramifications throughout the whole department because they didn't see it coming. He was somebody that was a good old officer that they loved. Um, why he completed that, nobody ever knows. But it definitely, you know, and I think that it spoke volumes to what they thought of him because that particular police um, department decided to put him on the wall of remembrance. They chose not to focus on that one snap moment where things were going bad for him and he, did, you know, unfortunately took his own life. They wanted to remember the good side of that officer. You know, mm-hmm. all the officers that I talked with, you know, they said every officer they talked about, they remember the good points of him. They, nobody ever said, you know, he's a troubled officer, he creates problems. You know, they pictured, the picture that I came from somebody never laying eyes on these officers was they were well respected. You know, mm-hmm. And I asked that question, were they well respected? And I got that impression 100% of the time. But when it came down to committing the, completing the suicide or committing that act, and they were successful, all of a sudden that switch gets turned and they become somebody that they no longer want to talk about. Mm-hmm. You know, they no longer remember them in that department. So it's a very sad thing that, you know, we can't realize that maybe and, and we need to look at from a, a community standpoint as well as administrative standpoint and law enforcement that this is just a byproduct. It's a work-related illness. You know, it's the stress of work that actually drove this person to it. Um, you know, we talked a few, on the last segment about the California study, and part of that was, and they did an interesting thing. They interviewed, or they sent a survey out to 500 officers just randomly through, like, nine states, major states, and they asked them, well, you, would you ever can contemplate committing suicide? 98% of those officers surveyed said they would consider 98% so the, said they would, but they put some caveats. So, I'm sorry. And 98% said they would consider. If. That, that is amazing. Things. It's, it's amazing. But now they had some, some little caveats. Okay. If, it, if it was a death of a child or a spouse occurred for terminal illness over, from terminal illness, a responsibility from your partner's death over an indictment, over sexual accusations, loss of jobs due to conviction of a crime, or being incarcerated. That's pretty much something they face every day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, because it ends up, you know, 98% of them said they would consider it. So, you know, loss of a job, why would you lose your job? You, know, you lose your job basically because you're mentally incompetent. You know, you're mentally, you know, something's happening, you know, you're depressed, you can't get up and go to work. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, you know, you're not dealing with the mental health aspect of it. But 98%, that's a huge number. That speaks the volumes to the fact that it's a suicidal intention is in the back of everybody's mind. It's that small percentage that actually carries it through. Well, I, uh, Audrey Honig, the chief psychologist for the L.A. Sheriff's Department, did an analysis of their officers, and uh, they found that they had a suicide rate. Well, nationally, we had a suicide rate at that time of 18 per 100,000 officers, which was you know, a lot higher than the general population. We'd actually, uh, back in the writing of this text, uh, we had averaged 450 law enforcement suicides in each of the last three years with only 150 officers dying annually in the line of duty due to non-suicidal reasons. So we were losing three times as many due to suicide as we were losing due to them getting shot or getting in accidents or, or whatever the thing is, which is a terrible tragedy. And what Audrey found out in her research was that research has always shown the availability of firearms, comfort with firearms, increases suicide rates. And that this was something that they found with a direct correlation between how 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 avid that person was about their firearm, which obviously you know law enforcement personnel are going to be much more pro firearm than the general population on a statistical basis exactly. anyway. Um, so I, I I could almost see you know it's kind of strange, and I'm not trying to do my own uh, digital memorialization of the officer that you just spoke of, but uh, maybe he just went home to the department to do it. Maybe that's where he considered exactly. to be most comfortable, you know. All right. You know, as I remember, he came from, like, you know, his mom, he, was a, he didn't have any children, you know, he lived with his mom kind of thing. But his apartment was his family. I mean, he probably did in his mind, came home, you know, to where he was the most comfortable to do it. And that's what's sad. You know, and the saddest thing, I think, you know, we throw out numbers like 18.5 and all these things. But that's what we know of. You know, unfortunately, there's no suicidal centralized data tracking base. Mm-hmm. To make the, to really get a total picture of how many do it, there's a wonderful organization run by um, Andy O'Hare called Behind the Beyond the Behind the Badge, excuse me, say Beyond the Badge, and he he actually tracks. He's one of the leading experts on tracking this, and for the first time, we've actually seen slightly a decrease, but still over 100 officers 
I think it was like 114 or 15 last year, maybe, that we lost to, to completed suicides, which, again, is 114 too many in my book. You, you haven't heard a quote, I noticed changes, but it wasn't induced. He didn't just start changing. There were some issues that had come up six months to a year prior. He talked about divorce. He wanted to transfer, was asking for time off a couple of days. He moved back in with his parents. He was staying at himself. He was a prideful man, and I think that got in the way. He was working toward doing the right thing. He found a letter in his bag, and I think that's why he kind of lost it. Always thought a little crazy. He went into the military late in life and washed out because he physically couldn't do it. So maybe this was maybe this was the situation where the officer just felt that you know nothing I've ever tried has ever worked. I, I couldn't handle the military. I got out. I got involved with law enforcement. I got. I was married. I couldn't handle a marriage. I couldn't handle the military. I couldn't handle law enforcement. I'm just. I'm all washed up. I'm not worth it. And especially since this person said he was a prideful man. Do you think that um, that our departments or that our society do enough to help these individuals to understand how important they are, so that they can feel some form? You know, there's extrinsic and intrinsic rewards. And the military, I think, does a really good job with extrinsic rewards insofar as, you know, easily observable rank, uh, ribbons on the uniform and badges for things that they accomplish and for acts of heroism and all of that. And I, I don't see a lot of departments that, that, um, that do a lot to give attaboys and to pat, you know, their public safety people on the back. It seems like they're just expected to show up every day, work the 12-hour shift, and do their thing. I think you're exactly right, and I don't think, you know, I, my way of thinking, because I think more outside the box, is our communities need to set aside and say, we appreciate you. Um, you know, maybe in small things. I mean, I don't think anybody goes into law enforcement to make a million dollars, and you know, and be, you know, they definitely don't go into make a million dollars. They don't go into for the money. They go into it for the personal rewards and gratification most of the time. But you know, to have somebody come in and say, we're going to bring you a, a buffet lunch, you mm-hmm. know, just to say thank mm-hmm. you in that small way. Have your your church schools, your Sunday schools, whatever, write thank you notes to law enforcement to, you know, to, to bridge that gap to let them know they're appreciated. It doesn't take a lot to make somebody realize, hey, they really did appreciate what was going on. The Pacino officer you're talking about, his history was significant. He actually worked three very traumatic murder, suicides, or homicides right before things kind of started spiraling downhill for him. Um, you know, he, there was a, a big thing, you know, and part of that department was very angry and did not even want to address the issue that he had committed, completed suicide. You know, his wife said, you know, we tried to get him help and he wouldn't go, the department wouldn't help us. You know, I think we've got to turn over the leaf of, I'm behind a badge and I'm okay, to, I'm a behind a badge and it's okay to get help. I'm not going to lose my rank. I'm not going to lose, you know, who I am as a law enforcement officer. If I say, you know what, Captain, I need to go get some help, and I may need some time off. But when I come back, am I still going to have my job? From what I can read and from what I'm being told, nine times out of ten, that may not happen. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're demoted, you're given something else. So the stereotype is, you know, you've worked really hard to rise to the ranks of, let's just say, captain or lieutenant or sergeant or whatever. You're not going to be as willing to go, I need help, if you know when you come back in six weeks or eight weeks, Mm -hmm. you're going to be demoted back down to a buck private. Mm-hmm. You're just a rank and file officer. So consequently, they they shy away from saying, "I need help." You know, mm-hmm. our stereotype as a community is they're, they're infallible. They're law enforcement. They're the best of the best. They can do anything. But what we've got to realize, and what the departments have to realize, is that they're human beings first. They have hearts. They have minds. They have spirits. They have feelings. I mean, just because they're behind a, behind a badge doesn't mean they don't have a feeling. They can't cry when we cry and weep when we weep, just like everybody else. I mean, you go to a scene and you see a mom crying, and you spoke yesterday about a young man who did a ride-along, and he couldn't hold a scene together when he went into a, a, a house where, you know, he's the person had completed suicide and it was a very nasty scene. You know, turn that around a little bit. Suppose he drove it up on a rack where, you know, a five- or six-year-old had been killed. You know, that mom's going to be sitting there crying, Law enforcement can't cry with them because we're supposed to be strong. Right. We're supposed to be the ones that hold it all together. But deep down inside, they're probably mourning, and they may see that as their five-year-old lying in that you know car dead. We've yeah. got to give them the time to be who they are first, and that's a human being. Well, very good. Very good way to end this segment. Um, let me give the listeners uh, another avenue of, of uh, support called the Cop to Cop Hotline, one eight six six cop to cop That's cop C O P. The number two and then cop, C-O-P, one eight six six cop to cop 
Uh, Tam, we're very good. I really appreciate the time that you've given us during this last uh, segment. And when we come back, uh, just kind of be thinking about um, uh, the impacts of corruption. And then let's talk more about this PTSS uh, thing that we learned about yesterday. It was no longer PTSD, it's PTSS. If you could help people to understand that a little bit better, too. And we'll be right back. <laughs> 